Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Dumelang. Dumelang is not just a greeting in Setswana, it also means believe it. Now I'm going to talk to you today about our bodies or as people representing the taula or divining bones using an application of the bone oracle as a methodology. We have or we are living in the current timelines or era that demand calls for reparation. The demand for call for reparations uh, demand the injustices of, of the painful past to be recorrected, to be redressed as urgently as we can imagine. This exercise would also require us to articulate and promote different routes to strengthening reparation goals and strategies. So reimagining and realizing African thought patterns can just be a window dressing mode of doing things just to show that we are complying to the status quo or contributing to the general consensus of recurring national crisis that encapsulates the three pillars that we normally call inequality, poverty and unemployment uh, in, in the country. So knowing that anything that we focus on always expands, expansion of, of our African epistemologies as a noble body of knowledge will also expand if we put more emphasis into it. Litaola or divination bones are one of the different tools that are used for divination. Other ones that are shared by Danina Buderi include the rock carvings or rock structures, using a sunbeam to trace someone who has been lost, and also using the healer's transpostures to find what could be happening around the person or what could be the situation around the world that we live in. It is a well-known fact that Western academic scientific disciplines regard divination bones or any form of divination of indigenous uh, way of knowing as being superstitious or as something that is called fortune telling. Uh, it is also a well-known fact that Western epistemologies have separated the body from the mind. So the philosophy of divination bones or the bone oracle carries with it a deep understanding of events and influences surrounding a situation, people or a person. I propose today that the philosophy coming from the, di from the Taola <laughs> or divination bone is that which gives people or bodies a situation and identity. It defines or describes the situation exactly what it is. So when we are reflecting or questioning our current timelines, we need to ask ourselves, how is this body? How as people, are we in sync with the current timelines or era? How do you as people, do we, do we understand ourselves in these current timelines in realizing African thought realities or thought patterns? But what do as people or as bodies, what do we consider African epistemologies or ways of knowing ourselves to be? How did this body feel with all the knowledge that it had during the global pandemic, it would appear as if we all faced a brick wall. None of us knew what we needed to do. Now, coming to when one has to focus on doing a conceptual framework, Ngulube et al. expand on the usage of conceptual frameworks, very interestingly, as being a researcher's navigation for issues that need to be explored. They say that this may entail combining various concepts from different theories. For this reason, it implies that the concepts may also include personal experiences of people, the knowledge of the content being studied or being explored, in this case, exploring the concepts of Mutakola, Twahadima, and Moferifiri. So in this presentation, a conceptual geology of Daniwa Nabuderi and Gungiwa Thiongo is being used because their concepts somehow inter intersect with African people's way of knowing and being. Gungiwa Thiongo says that we need to sanitize our minds, we need to decolonize our minds, we need to unlearn the Western ways of knowing that sort of demystifies our African ways of knowing. 
we need to use the African context to assert the African realities and our worldviews. We need to move from the modes of being dismembered to remembering our visions and practices. Nabuderu, on the other hand, encourages us also of knowing, of knowing ourselves and our realities in our life world, as per our cultures and languages. Using a conceptual overview of this application, uh, focusing on Motwa's bone divination, I regard Motwa as someone who was also a, a divination bone, who was Taula. Motwa's bone oracle and philosophy of interpreting divination carries with it a global healing perspective or a global healing context that offers hope, that offers peace, in checking or examining or diagnosing whether there could be peace or whether we could find hope in certain situations. Baba Credo Motwa's bone divination gives with it more a philosophy of interpreting divination by giving this global perspective uh, nationally, locally and internationally. He was also regarded as the highest Sanusi, meaning he was the highest indigenous healer of the highest kind. So the application demonstrated here portrays Baba Mutwa as Taula himself. A true reflection of him is that sometimes he would appear as a plurality of the Taula or divine bones. Baba examined and diagnosed the human race. That was this was a healing, a global healing perspective he carried. He would examine and diagnose the human race, the earth, sharing with humanity the pego or medicines in the form of words and statements he has written down in books, sometimes giving warnings or predictions in his books or in videos that he has shared with us. Now, my focus of the talk today or my, my focus of the presentation focuses on the application of the bone oracle as a methodology, but one would ask himself or herself as a methodology to do what? As a methodology to identify realities, not just only African realities, as a methodology also to explore injustices of interpretation. Injustices of interpretation here, I'm coming from the angle of learning to name things by their true name. Naming things by their true names what I mean here is that if we regard the current time timelines which dictate that people are living in a democracy and yet the general feeling is that of the opposite, it means that we must name the current position, positionality that we find ourselves in, in the truthful terms that we can name it, not the democracy. If the general consensus is not that of a democracy, then name the positionality you find yourself in by its genuine name. Now, if you are to critique an epistemology, I would think that if you want to approach any methodology or anything that how you want to run your, your research or your exploration, if you are, you are to critique a methodology would it mean it would mean also that you have critiqued the epistemology that you are always uh, uh, focusing on the epistemology that you have always subscribed to so i felt that it would also make sense that if the knowledge is also of colonial construction it would also apply that the methodologies that we are using are also colonially constructed being a known fact that knowledge has been colonized so not only do we have epistemological disobedience or epistemicide methodologies are also colonially constructed the body many times feels out of sync hearing terms qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods, sequential, particularly if these methods do not want to privilege an African perspective or an African way of knowing. Scholarly habits in the wave of redressing injustices of the past subscribe to these methodologies that it is the standard. This is how it's done. Will redressing be standard or be disruptive of what we are used to? I believe that if we reject some of these methodologies or uh, epistemological, epistemological disobedience, 
it is equivalent to privileging African indigenous methodologies. Moving forward, moving forward on critiquing of a methodology, we need to ask ourselves as well, what would we mean by the notion that Eurocentric paradigms are diametrically opposed to African paradigms of knowing? Does this notion prove and speak to the body as a divining bone? Divining by rejecting what is used to, what is subjected to, dismembering itself from that which in its nuclearity was colonially constructed. So to me, it seems like privileging and reimagining African epistemologies is equivalent to giving less privilege to Western centric thought patterns. This point of departure leads to critiquing methods often subscribed to in the academies. So this calls us to reimagine, to retell our stories, to remember the visions and dreams that Danina Buderi talks about, that Walt Yongo talks about. Redress the injustices of the past, but yet in doing so, we forget that redressing needs to be cumbersome with also acting. Nyoka says that we cannot just talk about decolonization and yet we are not doing any actions of decolonizing or acting. Can you still see my slides, guys? Yes, we can, Miss Cooper. So I was still on the point of Nyoka saying that when we talk about decolonizing it, and yet we are not doing it, this is synonymous with epistemic uh, posturing because we are not doing the actual act of decolonizing. So my points speak to what we think we know. The terms of language we use, the failure to trace the originality of these terms, and what could be the relevant questions to ask. What I mean here is that if we are focusing on unlearning to relearn the new modes of research, the new modes of privileging marginalized disciplines, marginalized uh, knowledge systems, we need to ask ourselves what could be the relevant questions that we need to ask ourselves instead of always having a research plan with organized questions. What I'm saying here, I'm saying that uh, Often when we have constraint questions of perceived categories, they always lead or they are bound to lead to the same answers. For example, if one would have a conversation with different people, one would realize that they all experience dispossession or mutlakola, but Takudi was something somewhere. Dispossession of their houses, knowledge, dignity, twahadima, death, impending danger or even experiencing chaos or disruptions in their, in their lives, which I call moferifere here. Uh, critiquing also speaks to what we think we know, the terms of language that we use, the failure to trace the originality of the terms. What could be the relevant questions that we need to ask? Instead of always having a research plan with organized questions. What I'm saying here, I was basically trying to say that always having constrained questions of perceived categories always lead to the same answers. For example, having a conversation with different people, one realizes that they all experience some kind of matagola or dispossession, but Takudi was something. Dispossession of their houses, knowledge and dignity, like if we are now trying to privilege our marginalized epistemology of indigenous or African ways of knowing. We have been in Mutagola space, also Moferifiri in their life world. One realizes that people experience all these things without categorizing them as qualified people or unqualified people or specifically maybe criteria, giving them a criteria that is of qualified people only. So what I'm basically saying is that same, hand, uh, same answers always fail to transcend knowledge. They fail to expand the knowledge terrain instead of always having a variety which expands knowledge. Uh, Mahmoud Mundani also invites intellectual decolonization in the spaces of higher learning institutions, 
institutions that constructed design or designed how the body or people should be defined via colonially constructed disciplines and methodologies. Nabudere asserts this point that it is indeed true that disciplines were constructed and further broken down into sub-disciplines that degraded African ways of knowing. Gordon, on the other hand, says it is very true that knowledge was colonized, and so it would very likely be that methodologies themselves are also colonized. But Gayeke, on the other hand, critically says we must evaluate the Eurocentric ways of knowing and discern or judge if and how they apply to the indigenous socio-political life and the impact thereof. So what could be the turning point if one would want to critique a research methodologies that the academy always makes us to subscribe to? My approach here casts people or the body as representing the interpretation of divination bones. When you wake up in the morning, the way your body feels, it tells you what you must do. It tells you it, it's, an, it's a diagnosis on its own. It tells you what it wants. It dismembers itself if it doesn't like something. It will tell you what it likes or what it doesn't like. Hence, I'm coming from that space of saying as people, we also represent divining bones. Motwa, on the other hand, also relays that the healer identifies the fall of the bones on the ground and interprets the fall and will prescribe the remedies needed for the person or for the situation or for the environment. Motwa states that the fall of the bones describe certain mystic patterns on the ground. A global healing perspective or a global healing context that Ubaba Motwa comes with tells us that these bones identify people's future. They advise on hope and peace globally like the current timelines that we find ourselves in. I relayed Baba Mutwa's description of the fall of the bones to us as people who are also on earth or on the ground. The positionality of people as bodies on the ground representing different interpretations of bones. As people or bodies that represent the divination bone of Mutakula. These are people who are dispossessed, people robbed of their ways of knowing, people who are constantly evicted from the land, whether occupied or unoccupied land, people who are dismembered, dismembered by death, people who are homeless, who are unemployed, people who are living in hell, the wretched of the earth, as Fanon would say. Also, as people who are living on earth or who are on the ground, we also represent people who show the divination bone of Twahadima, the one that represents danger, death, lightning, things that we see with our naked eyes as everyday realities. These are people who are susceptible to accidents, road accidents, people prone to all forms of violence as we get to be inundated day in and day out with gender-based violence issues. And the other concept that I also explore, explored here is a divination bone that describes Muferifir. These represent people who cause chaos, confusion, troubles, or disputes. Koroyadira in his in her thesis describes this as Mpirifir or Omatebe, meaning Mpirifir or chaos or disputes that are cheeky, things that causes in fighting. So divine, di, divining bones interpretations, they are terms or language are being used here, here to help us define our current timelines as living in the timelines of Mutlakola, living in the timelines of Twahadimas, living in the timelines time of Miferifir. And the turning point as well that validates and gives credibility to this is how Mutwa also synonymously with how research in Eurocentric uh, modes of doing is also triangulated. Triangulation of research in bone divination, Modi, Motwa accords it to bones being thrown in different places. He says on a mountain, on a, an open country or a sacred site, or even at a cave or inside the hut. 
Motua asserts that if the findings or the data yielded is the same, it gives credibility and validity that the findings must be accepted. The triangulation of the divination concepts used here is imagined as people or bodies are positioned in the academy, in blended families, as different race groups. No one would say they do not experience Motlakola, Tahadima, or Mufirifir in the academy or in their blended families, blended or not blended. As different race groups, what could be the Motlakola dispossession? What could be the Tahadima, the dangers? What could be the Mufiriferis or disputes that we find ourselves in? Mutwa empowers us that we must be able to feel as well as people. We must be able to feel what is happening around us. He coined something that calls a mother mind. He says we must have a mother mind as people, a mother mind that thinks laterally, that thinks sideways, sideways, and upwards and downwards. He urges humanity to be able to feel extraterrestrially what could be embedded in the stone, for example, or in a rock. He says we must imbue ourselves with this knowledge. What could be the materials that are lying in that stone? What could be uh, in the tree as well, for example? What could be the medicinal ingredients of that tree? The interconnectedness with things animate and inanimate is what Mutwa said we must also privilege in us. In talking about this, this is what has happened mm -hmm. to me. On the 27th of February this year, something around 20 to 5, I was driving between Soshanguve and Mabopani, approaching Giant Stadium, when I, I realized or noticed that the clouds were dimming the sign. I took two pictures. This is the first picture, and this is the next picture. And as I was driving, I was aware that this is dangerous. I can't take a picture while I'm driving, but I had to take a quick picture of this. So this is how the picture came about. Going back to what Mutwa imbues us to have or invites us to have, to be feeling what is happening around the surroundings, I immediately felt that meaning there's a prominent figure who will leave us. This being the 27th of February, I learned with amazement and awe on the 25th of March when Baba departed and left us, showing that he was also refusing to be locked down from the 27th of March as, as the country we went under lockdown. It is Motwa who envisages and also says that we must promote an African indigenous research methodology. In Indaba, my children, one of his books, he says the African conducts research on a very different plane from that of the white man. And for this reason, he has made discoveries that the white man has overlooked in his headlong rush to outer space. The black man possesses tremendous knowledge that could make a great impact even on the modern world. And he has hidden this knowledge now for hundreds of years under the cloak of voodoo and black magic. To advance what uh, Ubaba Mutwa is saying here is that the black man possesses overpowering knowledge that can make a huge impact in the modern world. However, this knowledge this indigenous knowledge remains hidden because of being perceived as black magic or as voodoo from a Eurocentric perspective. And so this knowledge is being dismissed. African epistemologies require us to be sensitive to context. So in other words, Ubaba Mutwa, like Mahmoud Mundani saying, we need to theorize our own realities. Ubaba is also telling us that we need to use our African experiences as critical pedagogy to expand on knowledge, to expand on what could be the expansion of research methodologies that we can also use. Supporting the images above with Baba Mutwa's philosophy on senses and take of Africans' way of conducting research is Danina Buderi, who says that there is a lot of scientific and philosophical knowledge that is hidden in African cosmologies and epistemologies. By way of conclusion, it is a request for this seminar series 
to be used sort of as a referendum to privilege African epistemologies in the academy across all disciplines to showcase how Africans love themselves. That is, how often would Africans choose things that are African to them in an African university? Also supporting this with one ancestor is Stephen Bantubigo, who in I Write What I Like says, on the whole, a continent or a country in Africa in which African people are the majority must exhibit African values and be truly African in style. But how can we be truly us if we reflect who we truly are in an African value system? We won't be in the spaces of mutakula or dispossession. We won't be dismembered. It would be a request for this seminar series to be used as a referendum to privilege African epistemologies in the academy across all disciplines to showcase how Africans love themselves. That is how often as Africans, how as often, how often would we choose things that are African in an African university? Supporting this is also Stephen Bantubigo, who writes in I Write What I Like That, on the whole, a country in Africa in which African people are the majority must exhibit African values and be truly African in style. So how can we be truly us? If we reflect who we truly are in African value systems, we won't be dispossessed. We won't be dismembered, but we will be remembered, remembering the visions and dreams that people like Ngugi Wathiungo invite us to also promote. We will have senses of imagination, senses of African imagination, having a coherent ideology that promotes indigenous epistemologies, what Nabudere says. Twahadiba and accidents will also decline. Also, not forgetting who we are born of. Ubaba Mutwa and Koroyadira expand on another divination bone, which is called Lehuame. Lehuame is representative of ancestors. Mutwa was representing Lehuame because what he warned the world about, what he warned the global co community about, is evidence here as people but is evidence here as living like in hell as he once said that he is not listened to no one takes him seriously and he said this country can go to hell for all i care ubaba was a navigator so the next slide plays a track or a song by our sister who sister tandiswa mazwai who also Accolades, other heroes that have graced this, this continent. We play this track to also promote those heroes, to also remember the, the visions, to also remember the dreams, the fightings that these heroes have done. And they also represent Lehuame or ancestors, as Baba is also Lehuame in here. The song was uh, just to elaborate again to support and to also show that the people who are represented there, the heroes that are represented there in the song also represent Lehuami, people who were also ancestors who had graced this world or this African continent. Uh, it would appear as if that our knowledge systems, when you were alluding to the effect of a curing of the cows, we don't have to wait for anyone to give us a pass. We don't have to wait for anyone to give us a sort of a signpost that, uh, you know, we need to test this. As an iconoclast as well, Paul Feyera Bent, an Austrian uh, uh, scholar, also said every project, every theory needs to be judged on its own merits. So what we need to do, we need to have the arsenal to do things the way we want to do them. As Steve Big also says, I write what I like. So we need to do things that we like, but also uh, working on ethical principles, also working on or having an ethical conduct of uh, conducting research or exploring or expanding on these marginalized knowledge systems. And also a uh, thinking uh, out of the box that if we have graduates who are not employed, mm -hmm. 
Sometimes maybe it's not because of the lack experience. It's not because of the lack something. Maybe we need to go back to the drawing board of rethinking our disciplines as Nabuderi as well here talks about. So just to summarize this is that we need to be bodies that every day when we wake up, when we wake up to the news, our current timelines, our everyday realities, we need to define our Am I being dispossessed? Am I in danger? Am I in chaos? In that way, small ways or bit by bit, we will be able to heal our nation and globally, other nations can also learn from us because we believed in ourselves. Thank you so much.